and it looks like freeze dried. And they're like, look, you can see the peas and the carrots and the beef and the. I'm like, it's still crap. I think <laughs> still crap. <laughs> I don't. Know. So um, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not really a fan of it. I mostly get ads for. Um, I was getting Animal Biome a lot for a while. Yeah. And I snoozed that one because I was just like, come on, I already bought it twice. And um, yeah, I did my review. I'm good. You don't need to show this to me anymore. And I'm now I'm getting, I was getting that, I think it's a vegan food for a mm -hmm. while. Hello. First. Hi, folks. And um, um, so I, I was getting a vegan food. So I just said that that was irrelevant and that stopped. But yeah, it's, it's, I rarely, rarely get anything that's related to kibble. Thankfully, now, now that I mentioned it a few times, um, I bet you yeah. all your, kibble your, your computer is listening <laughs> I get it because, you know, sometimes when I'm researching stuff, I go to a kibble thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you've, if you've searched it. Yeah. And since I don't, Hey, no, I don't even look at the, I don't even care about the ingredients. I did think that, um, and we're just rambling while folks come on in. So hello, everybody. What I did think was interesting is um, Sarah shared a, a graphic that showed, you know, like Nom Nom Now ad of, you know, only six ingredients. And then the screenshot of their ingredient panel, which is obviously way more than six ingredients. Yeah. It made me wonder if the six ingredient was a nutrient pack, but they broke it out. It made that it was some sort of premix. Yeah, that's it what did. I wondered. Hey, so. what about the meow mix recall? I saw that. Oh I my god! That. What's so sad? Yes, about, again, another. Well, if you have this in your house, throw it away now. That level of urgency is kind of scary. Yeah, it's most of the foods were sold in the Midwest. But it was largely 30 pound bags of meow mix. Wow. All right. So we know it's the crappiest food on the planet. Rest and we know you shouldn't have more than a month's worth of kibble sitting around. You're buying a 30 pound bag for a Res cow. rescue groups. Rescue groups. Shelters. But and this kibble is getting is being recalled for salmonella. Everybody's so quick to say, oh, raw food, you're gonna get salmonella. Well, guess what? Guess what? All this kibble. Um, just incredible. Oh God. And Thixton will come out with it in the next couple of days. I was talking to her on my way home yesterday. She got the final numbers for the Midwestern food recall. I want to say it was like 65 million tons of food of kibble. And I, it was just mind boggling. I have to ask her and I want to break it down into, if you had a 50 pound dog, how many 50 pound dogs could you feed for a year off what was recalled? And I bet you the number will be staggering. Absolutely yeah. staggering. So hello. So we got 25 people in the room. We're happy. I'm excited. Um, today we're talking about what to expect when you start feeding raw. So I'm going to put this out right now and just say, um, we are not going to be going off topic. And the reason why is because we tend to go off topic and it takes us a long time to get us back on topic. And two, I kind of want to keep our videos to about 30 minutes because we lose so many people after that. So staying on topic, you guys have questions that are not related to transitioning to raw. And we will stay here for an hour if people are asking questions. That's not a problem. But if you do not have questions related to transitioning to raw, then I highly encourage you to talk to your vets and one of us a private message if we send a message so we know what kind of topic to do in the future. Yeah, we'll we'll so try to answer if we can. Um, but if we can just stay with this, so um, this is so much fun because when it comes to talking about like our origin story and why we started feeding raw, Kozier is probably one of the few people I know that started feeding raw because it made sense rather than. Um, I have a dog that got sick. So I'm one of the, one of my dogs was sick and nothing else was working. Raw worked. So I stuck with it. But Dr. Kozier, you have been feeding raw for longer than we've had social media and Facebook groups where I'm gonna make know, a, thousand, a thousand experts tell you how wrong you are in every single thing that you do with your dog. So um, what, you know, briefly tell us, you know, what, what made you switch to raw? 
And you know, what was it like then as compared to what the energy about raw feeding is now? Well, uh, you know, let me speak to the then because back then uh, I was actually feeding the first dog I owned on my own as an adult. Um, and back then it was Volhard diet. And I say Volhard to people now and they have no clue of who I'm talking about. And I only know because I know you. Exactly. So here's your history lesson. Google up Wendy Volhard, V-O-L-H-A-R-D. The book is The Holistic Guide to a Healthy Dog or for a Healthy yep. Dog. It, and I own that book. You own that book. I own the book in the first and the second edition um, or the first and the third. Wendy was advocating for raw diets back in the 80s. That's before Tom Lonsdale, before Ian Billinghurst. I don't, I, Rodney was probably in diapers. Let's, let's just, <laughs> um, Karen maybe was in high school. Uh, Wendy was a woman ahead of her time and she developed this diet and she is one of the most fascinating people to read her work because she brings in seasons and Chinese medicine and iridology and all sorts of this voodoo. But her philosophy was you should eat differently in the morning than in the evening. And there's a lot of stuff coming out that supports that. So her AM meal was more cereal oriented and she did use grains. So there was buckwheat and millet and quinoa and not, not your typical rice and oatmeal. And in the evening, you did your meat and vegetables. And she had apple cider vinegar in there and different supplements. And it was calculated and proven to be nutritionally complete. So, you know, feeding these, these AM, PM meals. And then she had a, a one-day fast built into her feeding plan. Again, back in the 80s. Now we we're talking about, oh, we should be fasting and intermittent feeding and everything. Mm -hmm. Um. And, you know, she would vary what ingredients were in each meal through the season. So there was rotational variety. Thanks for putting the book link in there. And yes, Diane, same Volhard as the temperament test and the how to teach dog obedience classes stuff. It was Wendy and her husband, Jack. And my mentor, Mary Ferentino, worked with them when they were all based in Syracuse. So just incredible people and I really think Wendy doesn't get enough credit for what she contributed to the beginning raw feeding um, movement and she's forgotten about. And so that's just, this is my thank you to her. She is still around and still working. Uh, the veterinarian that she worked with, Dr. Carrie Brown, who she co-wrote the book with, uh, I don't believe he's still alive, but he actually, they did blood testing on the dogs. They did a feeding trial. It was way ahead of, the, of its time. And it was, you know, the 80s. It was a long time ago. So that's my Volhard pitch. Sometime I'll bring you down. I have one of the original, like, comb-bound copies of how to make the recipe. And it made big batches. And I had this stuff sitting in my fridge. Um, and my, the protein of choice was beef but they encouraged other proteins and such. And she, we had kefir, you know, fermenting on the counter, all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't think of. And my God, it was 40 years ago when she came up with this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's astounding to me. So really I bring is. that up, you know, the fact that, you know, Dr. Kozier and so many others have been feeding raw for decades and they are raising healthy dogs. And the reason why I always, this is like always such a great reminder to me. I always think, you know, whenever I'm starting to stress, because even though after eight years of feeding raw and having a blog about it and all that, I still get stressed out about it. But when I do, I think, oh, Lori was doing this before Facebook. Yeah. And she managed to do it without, you know, flip it out or harming her dog. So I'm, I got this. Everybody and, can do it. Yeah. So the this world where, um, although I do have, I mean, we both have the same software. We bought it around the same time for formulating meals. Um, and we both are basically um, fishing from the same well of information and trading information and learning things. But when it comes down to it, this world that we live in today, 
where everyone is recommending software and um, you know, you have to have these spreadsheets and calculators and all of these things to feed our dogs. Um, I don't know. I, I think that it's helpful and it makes things easier, but I don't think it stops you from being able to feed a healthy, nutritious raw diet if you choose not to go that route. That's all. Yeah. You know, I think we do need to be aware um, only because I see people taking, you know, let's say 80, 10, 10 or and pick your favorite <laughs> feeding program, you know, feeding philosophy. And there's this thing called recipe drift. So, you know, they start out and they're doing pretty well. They're following, they're weighing stuff, mm -hmm. they're measuring whatever, and they're staying true to their philosophy. And then we're human and we get lazy. And all of a sudden, you know, the omega-3 supplement falls by the wayside. Or, oh, gee, I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have enough bone this time. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon, you know, they're no different than the owner that I briefly mentioned fresh food feeding to comes back and said, yeah, I'm feeding chicken breast, peas and carrots <laughs> and maybe a little rice three times a week. You know, so I like people to have something that makes them accountable to be thinking about what they're putting in the ball. Not that they have to have a spreadsheet, but they have to know, Hey, I'm meeting yeah. my dog's needs. Yeah. This is why I find, making huge batches of food so much easier. It's just like when I can make huge batches of food where by the time I, I'm you know sitting in the morning or standing, putting everyone's food in the bowls, the only thing I have to even think about adding is omega-3 fatty acids, mm -hmm. um, my supplement mix, which I am gonna blog about. I, and just to, as a quick story, and I will not answer any questions beyond this, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, I take a bunch of supplements, mix them together and create like a super supplement blend. It's just something that makes life easier for me. Um, it's not about balancing a meal. It's just about getting certain supplements into my dog's bowl. Don't ask me any questions. Wait until the blog post comes out. So, uh, but that's basically what I do is just like, cause it makes it easier. Cause what you were talking about, about the recipe drift is that when, when I used to just add, you know, food to the bowl and I would basically have everything into different containers. It was took so long and right. everything took forever. And then you start doing shortcuts and you're telling yourself, Oh, I'll just do it in this afternoon. I'll just make sure they get it in this afternoon. But when all I have to worry about is basically adding fish, cause I add fish to my dog's diet every other week. Um, you know, and then every dog's individual supplements, life is so much easier. Yeah, it, it's really a lot better. But yeah, that I can I, that's happened so many times. Certainly, some supplements really lend themselves to making a combo mix. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when you have to dole out five and six things into each bowl, it's yeah. time consuming. Now that being said, and you you said it too, you know your omega three and your oils should be added at the time of feeding, not big batched. Yeah. Yeah. Or anything that's measured in super tiny um, amounts. I had someone, God, I looked at, I've looked at so many cases this week. Uh, they were using phytoplankton and the amount of phytoplankton was so oh, small. I know. I know. You know. You're not meeting any needs with this. Yeah. Phytoplankton, I'm not, I don't think it's a bad thing, but in order to get the amount of, mm -hmm omega threes or anything you're looking for from it, it'll cost you 40 bucks a day for a 50 pound dog. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm trying I, to find a blog post that I wrote. You about wrote about it. Then. Well, and you know, a certain dog magazine has their own, the owner has their own brand of supplements. And basically I think they, they really leverage the phytoplankton argument Um phytoplankton gate diane says yeah <laughs> it's a sell product and it's like dude you're not this is not a good investment of your money to get this nutrient into your dog's body okay so i'm typing it in there phyto why do these words have to be so long mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah because that's what kind of day it was <laughs> but yeah i do not add phytoplankton and the reason why is like you got to you know, we're both friends with Rodney Habib and just every now and then you'll get a text message from Rodney and he'll yeah. be like, guess what I just learned? 
And, and it's just basically, he's, if you look at, if you click on the link to the blog post, the graphic that I use for it will look very familiar because um, it's his, he made a graphic for me because he was like, I think he should write a blog post about this. Yeah. And he made a graphic for me. Oh, for as it. an aside, the forever dog is number one pre-release on Amazon in the pet and whatever the pet category is. Oh, that's so, so I got my copy. You got your copy? Cool. Yep. And and I'm getting a, a signed autograph copy too. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> so I'm getting that one as well. But yep. I'll um, put the link to the Forever Dog because it is available for sale right now. Yeah, it'll be out in October and um it's it's wonderful. So you need your copy. So and remember, uh, Karen and Rodney will be at my event in 2022. So bring it along. You can get it signed. Rebecca and Rodney. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you in the big batch thing. And I did a food consult yesterday with a woman. And she, I liked her a lot. She lives in the real world. She's challenging. I mean, she definitely made me work, but that's a good thing. And I said to her, she's feeding a 72 pound dog um, with multiple issues. And I said, you know, where do you fall on the, I need convenience or I need cheap. And she, she said, you know, I, I love the idea of DIY, but I work two jobs. The second job is to pay for my dog's needs. Mm -hmm. So I need convenience. I'm thinking you could give up your second job and be home with your dog. <laughs> but everybody, you know, has their, their thing. Um, but, you know, starting off raw or starting, you know, a fresh food transition, um, which is what we're supposed to be talking to. Talking and about. Oh, just, just a reminder, Forever Dog has not been released yet. It's not released until October. If you guys are curious about the dog, head over to the link that I shared to see the listing over on Amazon and you can read all about it. Yeah, but um, the the book is not released. But um, but yay, yay! So we're talking about what to start or what to expect when you're feeding Rob. So you see how when you we we even just strayed a little bit from the topic, and we were all over the place talking about people's book releases and phytoplankton. Um, so when you first start feeding Rob, um, when I first started feeding Rob, nothing happened to my dogs. No one got diarrhea, no one vomited, no one detoxed. All the things that people told me were gonna happen, not one thing happened. And I thought it was just a fluke. So maybe like, maybe these dogs just didn't happen. I have fed raw to one, two, three, um, four, five, six dogs now over the past eight years. None of them have had diarrhea. None of them have vomited. None of them have gone off their food. Yep. None of them um, had a detox period. I think the only thing that I experienced, and it's funny because I even forget that this happened until someone asked me about their dog, is in the very beginning, because my dogs were not, were used to eating kibble, the cold of the raw was a turnoff for them. So at the very beginning, and I started with Darwin's pet food, what I would do was I would heat it up. And so I would either heat it up, like sear it in a pan or put it in a, a microwave dish and run it for 15, 20 seconds. I checked with the company and they were like, yeah, that's perfectly fine to do. And I fed it that way until my dogs got used to it. And years later, I realized that, you know, I could also just make, which I would never have done back then because I didn't know, but I always have tons of batches of bone broth on me. So today, if I have a new dog that's not used to the cold, I would just warm up bone broth and pour it over it to take the chill off. But that was the only thing that happened when I switched to raw. Yeah, I'm just I'm just counting dogs here. You inspired me. <laughs> so just thinking of my Aussies. Um, oh, and I gotta I gotta count Kindle. And who else do I have to count? Who else live with me? Well, I'm at 16 Aussies that I have fed raw. And yeah, same story. And some of those, um, like Sketcher, like um, Scheme came to my house kind of unplanned. Like, mm -hmm. hi, I'm at a dog show. I see my friend. Why don't you take this home? Okay. And went from eating mostly kibble 
to eating raw in my house, you know, in one meal, because I'm not going out and buying kibble. No problem. No problem whatsoever. So these people who stress on the long transition and the detox and stuff, um, I think they're overthinking it sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I assuming, assuming a healthy dog. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a dog with a medical problem, I will do a different transition and I may have some support strategies for transitioning that individual. Mm -hmm. But normal, healthy dog, not so much. Yeah. I mean, and it's not to say that, you know, of course, every, you know, we always say every dog is different. There's always going to be a dog that experienced something. Sure. But that's not to say every dog is going to experience it. So oh. if you're brand new to raw feeding and you're joining all these raw feeding groups, first of mm -hmm. all, just me giving unsolicited advice and being a know-it-all. Whatever stop you do. Joining, yeah, stop joining all the raw feeding groups. All you need is one. You need, in my opinion, one raw feeding group. If you want a recommendation, my first recommendation is raw feeding 101. My second re recommendation is raw feeding university. But one raw <laughs> feeding group. <laughs> getting a delivery. And then um, one group. What are you, are you guys just barking for randomly? I think you are. And then one group that just sort of talks about raising dogs naturally. I mean, not that it'll say that, but you know, like they, they, they cover all the topics, including kibble diets as well. That way, if you're still feeding kibble, you can, or you just want to learn more than just raw feeding. Cause you know, so that's why I do. I, I actually went through my groups that I belong to and left 20 groups last night. It's like, stop yeah. adding me to groups, people. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if you should join the groups, don't comment, just read because yeah. some of them, some of these people just have nothing better to do than to take out their anger issues on others. Yes. So, you know, don't, don't post a picture of your fat dog in these groups because you will. Oh regret it. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm a person who, you know, I, I had a fat dog. She has since passed away, not because she was fat oh. and she did lose the weight, but you know, Zoe can stand to lose some pounds. And then, um, Scout, who was on prednisone for over a month, gained yeah. four pounds. And so now he's on a diet to lose those four pounds. So, yeah. you know, weight happens. You know, why do people feel they just need to comment on everything? Everything. And, and I think, and it's gotten worse because everyone's sheltering in place. So we're all on our phone. We're all experts. If I've been, it, it, my best is the people who have been feeding raw the longest. And I mean, people who've been feeding raw since pre Facebook and all of that. They seem to be the most mellow about it because they've seen the community and the transitions and, and they've learned the most and seen the most. Well, it's and, people who've been feeding raw for three months and now they're yeah, Well, like I'm saying, oh, I wait, I'm, I'm at 17 dogs. I forgot. Good to Lord, you're, yeah. you're an expert. Well, but, you know, when I think about it, I mean, my first Aussie was born in uh, 1994, was Spy. Um, so... You know, that's that's a lot of dogs ago. And, you know, when you tend to have three, four dogs mm -hmm. at a time, yeah, dogs coming through my house that might spend six months, a year with me um, and then go elsewhere, you know, all of a sudden you got a lot of dogs. Yeah. So there's that. So, you know, your dog might, I mean, just let, as if you were to switch from one kibble to another kibble and your dog might have some type of tummy upset, your dog might have some tummy upset when you feed raw. And the thing, what prompted this discussion was someone sending a message about, um, and, and someone left a comment on an earlier Facebook Live that I did, um, about someone had just started feeding raw, one day in, their dog had diarrhea loose stool, and they were freaking out in the group. And then everyone is telling them all of this information and all these things they need to add to the diet. And this is why I don't say anything in raw feeding groups and why I've left most of them is because it's kind of tempting to want to go in there and just be like, shut up. This is not what you just, just think about that for a minute <laughs> and say, you know, if you went out and you ate a bunch of spicy, spicy food, <laughs> you know, you might experience a little diarrhea. Yeah. Just a little bit. You panic and run to the ER or urgent care. Exactly. And no, but you might choose some blander options the next day, or you might or fast. Wait you, might not, 
yeah, you might want to, you might fast the next day and just take yeah. it easy. Yeah. yeah. That's the same thing. Hey, you know, I had blowout diarrhea, but I feel okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll have some more. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, you know and it's to die in these people who run to their social media and panic. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. So, yeah. So, yes, definitely, you know, keep in mind that diarrhea happens. It, it happens and it's going to happen a lot, not every day, but over the life of the dog, you're going to have days when it's, it's diarrhea. Diarrhea mm -hmm. to me is a sign that, oops, something didn't go right and to pay attention. Yeah, I don't think it's not that we shouldn't take it seriously. It's that um, it's a sign to monitor. Um, be wary. I just I always think it's a terrible idea to take questions to social media. I just, okay. I, I mean, I understand that people want, they're freaking out, they wanna get comfort, all of that. I just think that when you go to social media, you're asking for even more trouble. If I would have counted on social media to tell me what was wrong with um, Scout when I felt a lump in my, his throat, I would have not taken him to, you know, based on the, the feedback that I got when I announced that he had cancer or that he was going to the vet to check if it was cancer, most people were like, oh, it's probably just this. Oh, it's da 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 da. Mm -hmm. So people either way downplay something that actually probably should be checked out, or they way overplay something that's really not that big of a deal. Yeah. Not a good place. You know, even, even if you're talking to a vet, you'll hear us say you need to come in because we can't diagnose it off your words. You know, sometimes we just look at something and know what it is, but we can't tell from what you're, you're giving us. Right. So, so diarrhea. <laughs> I wrote a couple other things too. Um, um, so as much vomiting on transition to raw. I I have experienced vomiting, and what it was was um, two things: mixing raw and kibble together was too much for Rodrigo, so he vomited mm -hmm. that up. Um, giving Rodrigo a full diet of uh, green tripe in the beginning was way oh, too yeah. for him. So eventually it, it, it went from, he only vomited once. It was, he ruined a rug. Cause imagine frat boy vomiting all over my beautiful rug, green tripe. Yeah. The rug, rug was toast, <laughs> but, um, but you know, but there is that. And then the, um, but that eventually turned into just loose stool. Like, so yeah. he only a little bit of tripe rather than an entire meal of tripe. And what was the other thing? Oh, marrow bones. Cause when yeah. I started eating raw, I also started, you know, T trying out bones and the marrow and the marrow bones was too rich. So um, everyone got a little vomiting. Yeah. And especially, you know, coming from kibble uh, dogs, their lipase production is not there and they're not ready to handle that huge amount of fat. Mm -hmm. So, and that happens in people too, who try to do keto diet and MCT oil. And if you've ever, you know, tried putting some MCT oil in your coffee in the morning, It'll churn your stomach because <laughs> you don't have you, your body isn't producing the enzymes to break that fat down, and it's not a good experience. Mm -hmm. So you know, watch the fat, and some dogs will be more sensitive than others. What yeah. are you laughing at? I'm um, laughing. I'm laughing at this. <laughs> no. I said, it actually happened right there. I remember when, and that was like. <laughs> seven years ago. The worst was when my two girls decided to counter surf a, the jar of coconut oil off the... Mm. Yes, I remember you telling me. And, and they were throwing up and I took them to work with me and they were double crated in a big, uh, you know, shoreline vet kennel. And they're throwing it up and it's like shiny because it's... Yes. And my poor technician, bless her heart, she was cleaning it up for me. I'm like, you don't have to clean my dog's vomit. I will clean my own dog. She's like, no, I want to get this to you, but it's making me nauseous. <laughs> and luckily, she did not throw up, but <laughs> just this shiny, oily slime. So Kelly says, you know, diarrhea depends on how long a dog's has it, also if recurrent. And that yes. is so very true, you know, with, because to me, I always let the first day go. You know, if it's not like explosive and my dog isn't acting sick or, right. or uncomfortable, or if my dog is totally normal, he just has loose stew diarrhea, I don't give it a thought. You know, a couple days in, 
if it's still consistently diarrhea, then I need to think about what's been going on in the diet, what could cause this. It's a lot easier today because we don't go anywhere. So, right. um, but you know, usually if, as long as it's tapering off, I have many things, you know, slippery elm, olewo carrot, um, a fasting day. There are so many things that you can do to just let whatever, because I want it to flush out of their system and then go there. Yeah. So, exactly. um, and, um, you know, one episode of diarrhea, it's, if it's prolonged, if the dog is acting poor, then I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing something about it, but yes, yeah, so what? Yeah. I mean, cause that's, it seems to be that that seems to be the biggest thing I notice is that people aren't, um, first asking, you know, well, how is your dog behaving? Right. Everyone's racing to the cure. And of course, everyone's cure is different. So it's just kind of like, exactly. So um, the next thing was, let, let's talk about this detox thing. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Everyone, that's one of the things that people like to talk about is, you know, are we going to detox um, or, you know, do dogs detox? You know, what can I expect? And the things I've heard is that, you know, they'll start shedding a lot. You know, maybe a goop will come out of their eyes. You know, they'll, that's part of the loose stool and diarrhea. Well, you know, that type of thing. Um, sometimes they'll have goop coming out of their ears. Maybe they'll smell because stuff is coming out of their pores. There's, you know, all of these things where basically your dog will look terrible. Kind of like, you know, for humans, it would be like the keto flu that people talk yeah. about where you yeah. feel terrible and then you feel better. I have never experienced any of that with I was going to say, or you'll see nothing. Maybe a little, maybe a little burp in burp occasionally, or a little bit of soft stool. I would say the vast majority of dogs do not quote unquote detox. Mm -hmm. And I think again, that's, that's fueled by, or, or the, the awareness of detox is fueled by, people wanting to go buy some supplements and do something. Yeah. Just yeah. feed your dogs, people. Just use whole foods. Just feed the dog. Never experienced. Sorry. I was going to say, or you'll see nothing. Uh-oh. No, I was, I'm going through, I was trying to take care of something, but I can't while we're live. So that's oh. all right. <laughs> but, we can um, do that. But yeah, it's, it's one detox, of the detox gate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, People love to make everything more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah. And I think it's not necessary. Action and do stuff and, you know, go buy the supplements or, you know, do the dance in the moonlight or whatever. No, sometimes you just need to give it time and continue with healthy foods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it is what it is. And I, and I totally get it. I think the other thing is that, if by chance someone's dog isn't doing well on a raw diet, it worries me that people will use the the explanation that oh my dog must be detoxing yeah. instead of seeking medical care. So yeah. um, so I'm not going to say that detox doesn't happen. I'm just going to say that in however many dogs I've fed raw to, I think I said it was six, none of them detoxed. So. Well, we're I'm still counting. I, I'm not I know. <laughs> Um, but no, I don't, I don't see that major reaction or some people will call it a Herx, Herxheimer reaction. Mm -hmm. I don't generally see that. You know, I see adjustment. I'll call it adjustment. Right. To, or adaptation to the new diet. Mm -hmm. And then I see them looking better. And, you know, think about it. Most of the people that we've turned on to fresh food feeding, they don't tell us our, their dog looked crappy. They say all of a sudden their coat looks better. Mm -hmm. or they're happier or they're, you know, something and, they, they tell us yeah. good stuff. Well, and, and it's because it's like a lot of times we don't even notice. I mean, just like whenever I see someone walking a dog and the dog is overweight, mm -hmm. there's a chance they didn't even realize that their dog is overweight or they think their dog is just a little bit overweight. Right. Because when you're used to seeing that and the other dogs around you are used to looking a certain way, it never occurs to you that anything is wrong. But when, yeah, it was the same thing to me when I switched to raw, I was just trying to give Rodrigo something to eat that he could eat and his right. body wouldn't respond right. badly to. Yeah. 
And it, it, when he lost weight and his coat was shiny and his behavior improved because he wasn't constantly uncomfortable or in pain and all of those, that was all bonuses, you know? Well, so and most of my veterinary colleagues that are used to looking at, you know, chubby puppies and fat mm -hmm. dogs and to them it's normal. And it's like, to me, I put my hands on it and it's like, no. And then because I'm blessed with the clientele that I have, a raw dog comes in and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, this yeah. is what you should feel like. I try to tell my my techs and support staff, you know, put your hands on this. You can actually feel that it's healthy or not healthy. Yeah. You, you know, if you work on that. And, um, you know, I don't know if we're seeing all the comments. So if you're asking questions. You might have to repeat them because someone took, yeah, they took over our screen. I went ahead and got them out. But they oh, took good. over our screen with the shout out. So we're not seeing the comments. Or the questions. Yeah, I did not hear you guys. I do saw. I did see one um, about the animal diet formulator and the pet diet oh, designer. Pet diet we'll designer. go back to that later. Um, but another question that I get a lot is, can you mix raw and kibble together? And my answer is always, it depends on the dogs. I personally don't do it because Rodrigo got so sick, and so mm -hmm. that was a sign to me that it's not a good idea. But I have had dogs that ate it just fine. And I've heard from other people who feed that way with no problem. Yeah. So it just seems like it's, it just depends on the dog. Yeah. There was the thought that kibble and raw digest very differently. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there may be something to it, but, you know, when I think about our dogs and the stuff they can eat, yes. you know, they can go from, you know, roadkill in and grow stuff that they find in the woods to whatever's in your trash can, to kibble, to crap, you know, snossages and stuff, they adapt. Yeah. So it, it definitely depends on your dog. And I would say if someone says, look, I can afford to do 50% kibble, 50% fresh food, do you think that would be better? I would say, yeah, go for it. Yeah. You know, and if your dog can't tolerate it mixed, then feed a meal of each. I mean, that's what I did for the first three months until we ran out of kibble as I fed raw in the morning and kibble in the evening. Yeah. And for those, I saw a couple of these type of questions. We won't discuss any particular health issues, but if a dog has a health issue that does not preclude them from eating a raw diet, I just personally think that, you know, um, if whether, if, I mean, I guess you could have experience, like for instance, I have experience feeding raw now to a cancer dog. I have experienced mm -hmm. twice and to a dog with EPI, which is exocrine right. pancreatic insufficiency. So if I get another dog that's diagnosed with cancer or is diagnosed with EPI, I have some confidence that I can feed the dog. Of course, every dog is different, so there need to be some adjustments. But if I don't have confidence, I got to reach out to the expert. So I will speak with a veterinarian who is pro raw, who is experienced in raw um, to, uh, or hire someone like, you know, Dr. Lori Kozier here to formulate a diet with that health concern in mind. I mean, and that's why I don't offer meal formulation services because a lot of times people won't remember to tell you certain things. And um, if I formulate a meal and a dog has cancer or a dog has diabetes or pancreatitis or any, a wealth of other health issues, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to, to, right. to tweak the recipe to, to um, meet a dog that needs, you know, like for instance, what Dalmatians need, a, a what is it? A low purine, low purine diet. Yeah. You know, they can eat a raw diet, but it needs to be a low purine diet. Those are type of things that I don't, I wouldn't know what to do and I wouldn't want to do things wrong. So definitely yeah. when working with a, um, animal, animal formulator, make sure it's someone who really knows what they're doing. Yeah. And you know, we've got, we've got companies like Darwin's that have diets formulated to be used in like dogs with kidney disease or dogs with liver disease. And I want to say Dr. Barbara Royal was involved in those or Dr. Judy Morgan. Um, so, you know, there are commercial options. Yeah. Um, I had a patient today that was seen at a specialty practice. It was crashing and it's probably got, you know, some sort of inflammatory bowel disease or intestinal cancer or something along that line. And of course the conventional medicine specialist is like, you must have, we would prefer you eat a dry uh, prescription hydrolyzed protein diet. And I'm thinking this little toy breed dog is not going to eat 
dry kibble. And it's the last thing the dog needs. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, if she won't eat that, then feed her the canned version. And it's like, well, you know, uh, not would not be my choice. Yeah. And I could I could tell you what to feed that dog. Of course, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the owner's choices will be. And I I don't know that these owners can stick to a set plan. Yeah. So I'm a little concerned about it, but and that's the, yeah. And that's the other thing is that when you do have a dog with health issues, it's a little bit more work. So when and, I, and you've got to do what you've got to do and it's yeah. not, like, Oh, she wouldn't eat this. So I gave yeah. her a slice of deli ham. Right. Scout and Rodrigo. Yeah. I don't get to cut, do shortcuts on, or I can do shortcuts, but they're very short, very tiny yeah. shortcuts on their diet because there are certain things that they need to have in their diet on a daily basis or else they don't do well. And so, but it doesn't, yeah, but as I said, it doesn't preclude them. So, you know, if you have a dog or have a friend who has a dog that wants to feed Rob and the dog has a health issue, you know, that is where you would want to um, hire someone who um, offers medical and um, mobile formulation consultations. Again, I'm going to keep plugging away and yeah. because it's just, it's better safe than sorry, in my opinion because you can think that you're doing it or you're taking advice from a bunch of strangers. Just because some stranger in a group has a dog with pancreatitis too, does not make them an expert in pancreatitis. They're a good person to chat with because you guys can compare notes. I did the same thing with Rodrigo, where right. one of my best friends I met because we started feeding raw around the same time for the same reasons with dogs that had very similar symptoms. But years later, you know, when the diagnoses are finally in, I, my dog has something completely different than what her dog had. But mm -hmm. it was nice to be able to compare notes and say, have you heard of this? And so that is really cool. But please don't let that be the end of your research. Absolutely. Um, so back to Heidi's question earlier, she mentioned um, animal diet formulator and pet diet designer. And both of us have used both of them. Um, and for me personally, um, Animal Diet Formulator is awesome. It wasn't in the beginning. Mm -hmm. well, oh, and I both had a mutual it hate. Was in the beginning. Yeah, and I, I we spend all this money. <laughs> I, had to, I had to freaking buy a PC because I'm a Mac person. Me too. And, a, and I bought a cheap laptop because, yeah. you know, they kept saying, oh, the Mac version is coming. And I don't know how many times I had, I had Jim, the tech guy's cell phone number. So yeah, I remember. It won't open again. Yep. And he'd just be like, go to the thing where you, I can get into your computer. And Jim would just play on my computer for hours and fix it. Yeah. But it is so much better now. So much better. I never liked pet. I opened Pet Diet Designer probably a total of three times um, and just hated it. I, I felt it. It was, it was clunky. Is, it's clunky. It's, it's awkward. It's mm -hmm. the screen is way too much stuff. Yeah. I, it was too much for me. And I think that the, you know, on in pet diet designers defense, when I went into that system, I did it at the same time that I was using animal diet formulator. So it wasn't like that was all I had. So right. I was forced to learn it and, and figure it out. I wasn't forced to learn it. I went to it. I didn't like it. I was just like, no, this is too much. I'm not finding what I need, but animal diet, design or animal diet formulator over here is I can, even though it wasn't perfect in the beginning, it was still a lot easier to um, use and get information out of where, and I, and I wasn't adding, I didn't need to add any type of data to it. That was, that was a huge, that's a huge mm -hmm. hole in pet diet designers. They do not have values for bone in meat. Now we are feeding raw. So I need nutritional value on a bone in chicken thigh. I type it in an animal diet formulator and it's there, but I've got to create it in pet diet designer. Mm -hmm. They only have USDA meats in there and those, you know, humans don't eat the bones. So it's all boneless content. Uh, so major, major hole. Yeah. In pet diet designer. Now and pet diet designer is only like 20 bucks. So, yeah. so know, I mean, yeah, the, the, the price point is like, night and day as far as like yeah. it's, it's better it's one of those where it's better than nothing and as long as you have the patience to to take the time to educate yourself i've known people who used it for a long time with no issues mm -hmm. 
And so you, but you know, you have to put in the work with animal diet formulator. I think today after they've worked out the bugs and stuff, I mean, there are still things that, you know, I don't like, like little silly things. Like, you know, you can reorder your ingredients, but it doesn't always keep it. It'll like sometimes revert back to the original order yeah. you had, which annoys me. Yeah. So I stopped reordering my ingredients <laughs> um, and they're, they don't add, they're not adding any commercial foods to their database. So they do have commercial foods. Honest Kitchen is in there and Dr. Yeah. Hart. And that's because Steve added those in the beginning. And so they stay. Yeah. Well, but and you know, I, I am so grateful that I get to talk to Steve on a pretty regular basis. Can you add them to add Dr. Harvey's paradigm and raw vitamins? Absolutely. I mean, I know it's not his, but I, I, well, I need them. Where I was going with this is he, he's such a nerd. He's wonderful. Um, he is always adding ingredients and questioning his numbers. And like I was using wheatgrass in a formulation and I said, Steve, my owner is asking me, is the wheatgrass fresh or is it powder? And I'm looking at the dry matter content and it's supposed to be 95% dry matter. So I'm guessing it's powder. And he's like, you know what? I don't trust those numbers anymore. Don't go buy them. You know, go buy, get the manufacturer of the powder to give you numbers and put them in. Yeah. And, you know, we were, he was talking about something else. And he's like, you know, these numbers vary if you look at the Australian numbers and the NRC. And I'm working on looking at a bunch of them. And then I'm going to come up with typicals. So anytime that you see that there's a typical value for an ingredient, mm -hmm. um, use that one because that's my best number. Because mm -hmm. you're only as good as the yeah. or see of your nutritional yeah. data on the yeah. raw ingredients. If it's bad data putting in there, you're going to have bad data coming out. Yeah, and, and it's too easy in pet diet designer to have your minerals all screwed up wow. because you don't have bone-in values. Yeah, and this is, again, why another reason to prefer animal diet formulator. I know it's a, a intense price point. If you have a best friend who's also a raw feeder and interested in doing this, I say go into it together and yeah. you guys can both use the same login. Um, I love it. And I haven't <laughs> been sorry about my purchase. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you are interested, um, I do check recipes. So um, I need details on what your recipe is. So if you're going to send me a list of foods and say, okay, is this balanced? I'm not even going to bother responding because I have to put in numbers like grams and pounds and ounces um, and specific foods. Yeah. So if it's a veggie mix, of course, I don't know what's in your veggie mix. So well, I was testing that. There are food companies, commercial raw companies that make veggie mixes or this mix or that mix. Mm -hmm. They are not consistent batch to batch. Yeah. So, you know, how do you account for that in your, your feeding program? Yeah. And, it, and the thing about it is I see Holly has a, a great question here. And I've seen similar questions where a lot of people seem to be, um, I, I think these are great questions to ask. I tend to be on the side of um, my dogs are going to be fine. Um, and I'm not going to worry about it. You know where it is because it's like, yeah, we can dig into the details of the nutrients and, you know, how do we know if, if this is going to be good and, you know, how is this going to compare to this? But, oh my gosh, if this is what you want to do because you're interested in this and this is fascinating to you, then I say go for it. Um, there are plenty of college courses that you can go into that'll teach you even more. It's great information. But if you're new to raw feeding or you're a raw feeder and you think that you have to do all of this work to figure out how to feed your dog, my only question to you is, do you do this work when you're feeding yourself? And the reason why I ask this is not to say that we don't have to do it for our dogs, but I know for me, I will not keep it up because one, I'm not really very interested in it. Two, I don't do it for myself. And so that means that I will talk myself out of keeping up with tracking all these nutrients on a daily or weekly basis for my dogs. So instead, I chose a different route to figure out how to make sure my dog's diet is balanced. That's why a few years ago, I switched from using spreadsheets and everything to using a base mix by Dr. Harvey's. And that was when I, um, I saw someone mention that they're waiting for their parsley pet results. This, this is a um, testing that Dr. Kozier, she reviews these 
and um, you know, send you back the results to so you know how you're doing, how your dog is doing. And my dogs are doing and great. That's, and that's a reasonable way to check yourself. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm always a little more concerned like these days. Well, I had an experienced raw feeding client come in and was complaining about how the dog was pooping. Mm -hmm. And, you know, started telling me what they're feeding. And this dog was getting four turkey necks a day. That's a lot of bone. Yeah. It's a lot of bone. And, and she said the, the stools are very white. It's like, well, yeah. I would probably, were I feeding your dog in my house, would be feeding half of that amount of bone. And, you know, so it's easy to screw up your minerals. It's easy to get too much copper in a diet and with the amount of copper storage disease we're seeing now. So I always feel like when you're jumping in, go buy a recipe from Planet Paws or mm -hmm. somebody. You know, Planet Paws generic recipes are three bucks a piece and they are nutritionally complete. So you can start with something so you get the feel of it. And then yes, to some degree you can riff off it. And you don't have to be exact, but you gotta be in the ballpark. Right. Um, and especially there, there are times I've screwed up. It's like, whoa, I ran blood work on my dogs. Their total proteins and albumin and globulins were low. It's like, okay, well, I was in a rush or a, a rush. I don't know. A rut, I guess would be the right term of using really fatty meats. And I need to bump my protein up. Yeah. It happens. So, you know, you find these checks uh, to ways to check yourself, whether it's parsley Blood testing, um, cal simp another run a spreadsheet, run a calculation, have Kimberly go through and punch your diet in in many ways. And so, Diane, yeah, you can check your recipes without it counting as a recipe. You just don't save it. Uh, or you could take a recipe and you just save over it each time. Just go in, delete all the ingredients or, you know, keep the base stuff and then add in. Like, because if you, once you figure out a recipe that works, it's not like I don't use animal diet formulator to necessarily formulate for my dogs. I use it to get a better understanding of the different foods that I can add to their diet that are nutritious. And so what I'll do is I'll create like the base. So that's going to be like the vegetables and the egg. You know, I have, you know, I always have like two or three eggs in the diet, um, you know, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, such like that. And then you're just changing the organ meat and the bone and the protein sure that way you can and you just adjust it ad again and again and so you can you can do that easily with animal diet formulator i mean i i've been i've had it for years and i haven't come close to meeting the number of recipes i can have so yeah, see, when i do consults and have to save it for them, <clears throat> i'll burn through but you know that's uh, what i do is different than yeah what exactly because i don't i don't take on clients um but I do one day want to do a live, planned on doing this during National Raw Feeding Week was a live meal formulation, but I got sick. That would be fun, yeah. Do a yeah, I thought it would be cool. So, um, but she, Michelle says, Dr. Kozier, can you do a formulation that has a base of PMR grinds and then go from there? Only if you have good data on your grinds. Yeah. I did one. You won't. Yeah, I did one from, we have a local farm that I get a lot of food from. And I got the the details of the grind from their package. So it basically showed me it wasn't just that it was a list of ingredients. They actually list out, you know, in a five pound chub, like this percentage of it is muscle meat, this percentage is of it. And so I was able to take everything from there and then build a recipe on top of that to say, well, and then have this chub, what can I do to make it meet right. my dog's nutritional needs? And it's it's really quick and easy to do. And that, but that does assume that every batch is the same. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of the, you know, people who get into, oh, I'll make a grind, a yeah. ground dog food, you know, okay, guess what? The cow liver wasn't usable. So there's no liver in this batch. Mm -hmm. Or we got, you know, we were a little short and, you know, all of a sudden one grind is not the same. And that's not necessarily that it's bad. Yeah. It's it's different. Different. Or how well was it mixed? Yeah. You know, I see, you know, I'm grinding on a small scale in my kitchen. And I see when I throw through, go through, you know, a bunch, throw a bunch of chicken in, and then I throw a beef. I can see how well I've stirred that. 
But if you're doing it in a commercial size vat, you might not. How long do you stir it for? How homogeneous is it? You know, and it, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it yeah. should be in the ballpark. But I mean, I think the thing that we have going for us in the United States, as much as they are a pain in raw food brands, butt, is we have the FDA and the FDA mm -hmm. has it out for raw food brands. Yeah. So it's in their best interest to, I mean, it's just impossible for everything to be replicated a hundred percent time and time. And again, that's just life, but it's in their best interest to do it as thoroughly as possible and, and do as well as possible. I think the thing that I avoid are the, cause there are a lot of people starting up raw food companies in right. their kitchen. Um, and I'm just sort of like, oh, nah, that's all right. Yeah. I have to know you well. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Put up Holly's question. Cause this is a good one. This one right here. This one right here. And this is straight from Steve Brown. I will not take credit for this. Uh, bones bones can vary a lot. The main variation is in, and I have his notes right here, actually. Beef, lamb, and bison vary greatly in their mineral content, depending on age of animal, size of animal, pasture raised or feedlot, what have you. So, you know, if you're relying on a product that has beef, lamb, or bison bone in it, and also how well it's ground, mm -hmm. uh, there could be a lot of variation. Poultry bones, excuse me, tend to be much more consistent in their mineral content. Good question. Yeah. And um, Janet, I there are a lot of cuts of meat that we cannot find data on. And what I have found is if I notice someone selling it, I'll contact them to see if they have it. So yeah. reach out to these raw food, you know, raw feeding Miami, um, you know, hair today, uh, my carnivore, um, you know, there are other ones too, but you know, yeah. those companies to see if they happen to have the, yeah. the information. I think Steve told me there is duck head data from Australia, but he wasn't sure the Australian, whatever their equivalent to the USDA is. Um, he wasn't sure how accurate, but it does exist somewhere. Yeah. And here we go. It's like, this is another thing. Just, okay. So we're at the end. Let's wrap it up. It's been almost an hour. So let's wrap it up. And let's, um, I think that this is a really great way to end it is, you know, my puppy won't eat raw. And I, I get that from people all the time. My dogs really doesn't seem to be interested. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, if you are interested in feeding raw, do not run out and buy one, two, three cases of raw dog food, just in case your dog is like, nope, not me. Yeah. Um, two, just because your dog doesn't eat raw today or this month doesn't mean that down the line, your dog won't be interested in raw. So right. there are things that you can do, you know, like for me, when I first started because of the temperature of the food, it was too cold. I warmed it up. So I know a lot of people will sear it, you know, just a little bit um, to get the aromas going and to take the chill off of it and dogs are all interested or pouring bone broth over it dogs are more interested sometimes adding green tripe to the bowl because that smells so strong dogs are interested in that but if you've done all of it, if you had all the tips on how to get your dog interested into this food and your dog's like nope that's not me you're insane then feed your dog a cooked diet i mean this world and I get it because I was one of those people too, where we go through and we think raw is everything. And how can you not want to feed raw? And that's the best diet ever. But in the real world, not everyone's down for raw, whether it be the dog, the cat or the human. It's just like, I can't do this. So luckily we live in a time where we have raw, we have home cooked, we have um, prescription, what, what subscription diets where they'll send it to your door, whether it be raw or home cooked or, or cooked. Um, we have freeze dried, we have dehydrated. Um, we have healthier kibbles now, you know, where if you just, hey, kibbles, I'm all kibble. There are brands out there that make it onto Susan Thixton's list. Um, and you, for a, you know, a nice donation, a uh, reasonable donation, I should say, I will put a link to it. You can get her list. Yeah, I think it's 10 bucks. Yeah. Well, and and what it does is support her so she can keep doing this work. Yeah, and she um she's not, she's not going to Cancun on it. Right. And she is I I really Oh, yeah. Good for you. So, I'm getting the link. I saw something someone wrote a blog post. We made it onto the list. 
never heard of the company before, but good for you. And you know, I do find some puppies are not huge eaters. They never live in my house, but <laughs> you know, some puppies are like, eh, especially, you know, teething, puberty, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So your dog is maintaining a normal weight. Don't stress too much. And she may definitely have some preferences in terms of the temperature of the food, whether it's ground or, you know, whole, mm -hmm. what she wants to do. Uh, some dogs want to eat once a day. Okay. Yeah. You know, feed the dog in front of you. So that is it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope we were able to give some spot highlight and sort of take away some of the fears of raw feeding. Um, again, I always just like to say, feed the dog in front of you. Don't let strangers bully you. <laughs> and it's not as hard as it seems. Agreed. <laughs>